So in each one of those previous examples that we did, the one um, where we factored out an x minus 2 and evaluated, and the one where we um, created the factor of x squared and got it out, each one of those cases started having the 0 over 0 indeterminate form. But through algebraic manipulation, we were able to get a more useful form for calculating the limit. We were able to swap out f of x for g of x and calculate the limit that way. So that's an important thing. So we need to be on the lookout for that. We have to be careful because we need to let the problem take us to where it needs to go. A lot of times we jump and we think we know exactly where it's going, um, and that's the point of these three uh, examples here, are that they look very similar and you could easily mistake one of these for the other. So let's look at the difference here. Okay, so I'm going to try and do this first limit, this one in A here. The limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus x minus 6 over x plus 2. Okay, well if I calculate <clears throat> what's in the numerator, I get 4 uh, plus 2 is 6 minus 6, I get 0. But in this case, the denominator is not 0, it's 2 plus 2, it's 4. Now 0 over 4 is simply 0, problem done. So that was not a problem um, where the function was well was not well behaved at 2. It was perfectly well behaved at 2. It was equal to 0, which is a perfectly fine limit. All right, in the next one here, let's try that again. If we try um, x squared plus six minus plus x minus six, well, that's the same as the other numerator, so I know that's going to come out to be zero. And this time, two minus two in the denominator is going to be zero. So I know that I have that zero over zero indeterminate form. Problem's not over. I have to do more. So let's try factoring. Okay. Now, I actually know that the numerator must have an x minus 2 factor because it's a polynomial, which is 0 when x is 2. So it must be, uh, and then 3, and we must have x plus 3 there. So what did I get? I get what I expected. This x minus 2 over x minus 2 is what was causing the 0 over 0. I now get simply the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 3, and plugging in 2, I get 5. Done. This last one, we're only going to take a look at initially here because we haven't done enough to talk about it thoroughly. But let's see. If we were to um, try and plug in zero uh, 2, we would get uh, 2 to 4 minus 2 is 2, because it's a minus now there, plus 6 is 8, and the bottom we get 0. Okay, now that's a whole different uh, ball game here. Obviously we can't have that because there's a 0 in the denominator, but there's not an x minus 2 factor in the numerator, so we can't factor that out and cancel it. This is going to be we're going to see that this is a limit that does not exist, but we're going to have to figure out how does it not exist? Is this an infinite limit, negative infinity, or something else? This would be, we'll have more to come. So we still have to look at more things for that. Okay, let's take a look at something totally separate. What's known as the squeeze theorem. Or actually, it's also known as the sandwich theorem, and you'll see why. Um, so the squeeze theorem is a very powerful theorem that's used a lot in mathematics. Um, we're not going to use it a lot here in Calc 1, um, but I do want to show you the idea. So the idea is that if you have, so if g of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to h of x, so in other words, f of x is always between g and h for all x in an open interval containing a, except possibly at a, because we don't care what's happening at a. And if the limit as x approaches a of g of x is l, and that's also the limit 
as x approaches say of h of x, then we know two things. The limit of f, which is stuck in between the two, must also exist because both of the g and h existed. And because both g and h were l, the limit as x approaches a of f of x must also be l. So again, this is a case where we have a very difficult f of x, and we're going to use simpler g and h's, um, which are much easier to take the limits and use them to find the limit of f. So basically, you could think about it you know, on a diagram like this. You have a, a g of x and an h of x on both sides of f of x, and f of x is stuck in between them. So if you take the limit as x approaches uh, a of g and it goes to l, and you take the limit as x approaches a of h and it also goes to l, then there's nothing else that f can do except also go to l. It gets squeezed to go to l. It gets sandwiched to go to l, however you want to say it. Uh, so that's the idea. So I'm going to show you with a more interesting example. It's a cl another classic example here. If we want to show that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine 1 over x equals 0. Now the first thing I'm looking at this is you might say to me, well why don't we just break this up and do the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared, which is easy, and then the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 1 over x. Ah, the problem there is you can only break a limit up if both limits exist. And this is that um, strange oscillating limit as x goes to 0. So we can't actually break this up. So let's scrap that idea. So that's not going to work. So let's try something else. So I'll just make a note. You cannot separate. But let's go back to a very simple idea about sine 1 over x. Remember I said one of the most important things about sine is that it's between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so you agree sine x, sine of 1 over x, sine of anything is between negative 1 and 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply through by x squared. So we get negative x squared less than or equal to oops, x squared sine 1 over x, which is less than or equal to x squared. All right, so that must be true. I multiply through by x squared, which is always positive, so no change in the um, inequalities. And so I have this true. So now answer this. What's the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared? Well, it's a plug-in. It's 0. What's the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared? Well, that's a plug-in. It's 0. So both the negative x squared and the x squared have limits of 0 as you go to 0. That means the only place this can go is to 0. So the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine 1 over x equals 0 by the squeeze theorem. All right, that's a wonderful way. This was a terribly difficult function, this x squared sine 1 over x. So what did I do? I used nice functions that surround it. So now the picture of this is kind of the classic example, and you wouldn't um, know this picture right away. Um, so what is this? So the idea is that we have basically um, x squared on top, and negative x squared on the bottom. All right, and then what does this um, x squared sine 1 over x function looks like? look like? Well, it looks like something like this. It has that oscillating behavior, but it actually decays into there. And then it does a similar thing on the other side. But you see how it's always stuck between x squared and negative x squared. 
So that's the idea is, instead of following along this red function, we follow along the black functions here, and they squeeze everything to zero, which is our limit.